Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network's BRN Sunday. I'm Jeff Snyder, your host. I'll be joined today by members of the media, academia, and financial services as we look around the globe and analyze all the issues related to retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more. We've got another great show, so sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. Well, we're going to kick things off with a look at healthcare. Joining us on the line, Lydia Ramsey Flanzer. She is the health editor for Business Insider. Hey, Lydia, welcome back to the program. Great to talk to you this morning. Yeah, you too. So, um, look, there's nothing much going on in healthcare, but I wanted to check in in on you, in with you anyway. You know, in all seriousness, I know we've had a lot of great news um, about vaccines and other uh, things related to the COVID pandemic. So, take it away. What's top of mind for you and the team this week? Yeah, obviously, uh, there's not a lot else going on besides watching the COVID case numbers rise and hearing about some of the optimistic vaccine results that are that are coming in. Uh, you know, these are early results, of course, and, and we're still only hearing about them via press release, so we haven't had a chance to really dive into the data around them. But obviously, last week, Pfizer shared that its vaccine was uh, effective at preventing COVID-19. Um, at least for symptomatic cases. And we heard the same from Moderna this week. Um, so Moderna is reporting that its vaccine is about 94.5% effective at preventing COVID-19, while Pfizer shared just this past week that its vaccine is 95% effective at this point. Well, I'll take both of those uh, if it means that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that, that seems like pretty decent odds. I mean, it is a vaccine, I guess, my question is, is a vaccine ever 100%? I mean, I guess there's always exceptions to the rule, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I think if you look at something like a polio vaccine uh, and I think smallpox, those are hyper-effective vaccines. I think they're somewhere in the 99 percentile mm -hmm. range of, of effectiveness. Um, but this is really great results thinking about COVID. You know, we haven't ever had in the history of the world a coronavirus vaccine. We have the vaccines we've had, like I mentioned, smallpox, polio, all their different viruses. We've never had one for a coronavirus strain like COVID, like the one that causes uh, COVID-19. Um, so that's a huge step. You know, I think a lot of experts coming into this were hoping for at least a 50% effective vaccine. So this kind of blows that out of the water, which is always helpful. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, absolutely. And it was done so expeditiously. And this couldn't come at a better time, as you mentioned at the top of the segment, with the rise in COVID cases, we're, we're into uh, Thanksgiving holiday. A lot of us will be uh, doing that remotely or staying at home, I guess, not going anywhere. And, um, you know, we're ramping up, I guess, into the apex of flu season, right? I mean, this is kind of when all these other things start to heat up or cool down, depending on your, your what, what terminology you use in terms of uh, being potentially get, get ill with something. So this, this could not come at a better time. Yeah, absolutely. And to be sure, you know, just because we're hearing about these promising results doesn't mean that, you know, a vaccine is going to be distributed starting tomorrow. Um, now it's up to the drug companies to, especially Pfizer and Moderna, um, to really file with the FDA. They were waiting on a little bit more of safety results mm -hmm. uh, to come in. They needed about two months worth of safety results. So those have been kind of trickling in this week. Pfizer this morning said that it is planning to file its um, apply for an authorization from the FDA uh, today, so Friday. Um, and so, you know, when that process begins, it's not a quick, yep, cool, it looks great. Um, the FDA <laughs> is going to take its time and really make sure that it's, it, it is working the way it says it is, like these vaccines are working the way they say they are, and that they're safe and effective. You know, some of these vaccines do have a pretty uh, notable, like, safety profile in the sense that, you know, some of these side effects are pretty intense. And so I'm bracing myself for, you know, <laughs> a bit of a sore arm after one or two of these injections and, and maybe feeling kind of off the next day. And then what are we hearing? Uh, uh, d definitely agreed, um, Lydia, but what are we hearing in terms of, okay, uh, distribution? I mean, there are there distribution plans in place that once it's approved, whenever that timeline is, after the FDA takes its time to assess this and make sure it's not going to have any negative effects on people that will actually kill people. Uh, do we have a plan in place or is there a plan in place to distribute this um, to people who need it the most, uh, the elderly, the people with comorbidities and people that are at ex more extreme risk? 
That's the hope. You know, I think we're hoping to see, I think everyone's kind of anticipating getting an emergency authorization sometime in December. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing to keep in mind with that is that it won't be a full approval. And it also will probably be a pretty limited scope of who is like the, the target audience, I guess, or the indicated group for that. So, so it'll probably prioritize those groups like you mentioned. Um, and then as far as distribution goes, it's obviously been something people have spent months thinking about. Um, for good reason it's going to be really complicated things are going to go wrong it's going to get <laughs> the vaccine's probably not going to get in the hands of everybody who most definitely needs it in those first couple weeks um but hopefully over a six month or seven month period by say july mm -hmm. we'll have a pretty substantial rollout happening um so we'll see how that goes yeah but the, very bright spots very optimistic but um you really uh, Lydia, have to wear your mask and socially distance, wash your hands, follow all the protocols, even though this is, you know, I, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? So this is on the horizon, but it's still incumbent upon all of us to lower the cases by doing all the things that we're being told to do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's a big thing. You know, the CDC this week said, please stay home, don't travel for Thanksgiving. Um, so, you know, it, it's going to be tough. To, a tough pill to swallow um and it's going to be really hard to do this and to say we've been at this for what eight months and you know we had some respite kind of in the summer depending on where you were in the country um but it, it this isn't over and it's easy to get complacent and even when we have the vaccine it'll be important to still practice a lot of the social distancing measures and wear masks when going places things like that because you know uh, it's it's going to be tricky to get to that point of quote unquote herd immunity with a uh, vaccine. Um, so, so we still might be quite a ways away from a new normal. Absolutely. But maybe a year from now, we will actually have Thanksgiving near each other with masks. Maybe we'll be at different corners of the table. Who knows how that goes? Lydia, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. We start off the show with some great news. Love the optimism. And uh, we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Welcome back. Now time to check out what's happening in tech this week. And joining us on the line, he's lead advisor and executive producer for 7 Investing is Daniel Klein. Dan, welcome back to the program. Uh, hey there, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Great to talk to you as always. And, you know, as our audience knows, you do double duty every week, appearing once on the podcast and also uh, every Tuesday talking about tech. So, Dan, um, Apple making news this week. I think they're trying to do some uh, make some changes to help some small developers or maybe not help small developers. What can you tell us there with some changes? Yeah, so this is a really big public relations move. What they did is they cut the fee they're taking uh, from 30% to 15% on apps that are not making a million dollars per year. So it sounds like a big deal, but the reality is they make most of their money from taking that cut from, say, Netflix or, or any of the big gaming apps that are mm -hmm. in. This is really good for smaller businesses because, look, if you have an app that's doing four or five hundred thousand or even a hundred thousand, uh, you know, paying fifteen percent rather than thirty percent is a big deal. So this is Apple kind of kind of saying, okay, we're going to take care of the little guy. It's a really good public relations move, and it's being done maybe to take a little bit of the federal pressure off of uh, you know regulation. And Apple's a closed garden; you don't have the ability to get on an iPhone uh, or, or an iPad unless you go through the Apple Store, mm -hmm. and that's something that government has been looking at. That's not entirely the case with Google. There are ways around the Google Play Store. So, uh, you know, I, I, when I saw this story that you had forwarded to me, I mean, I, I immediately said small business, small opportunity. You know, these businesses are struggling, right? I think this is a overall a really good move. I, you know, I wasn't really thinking maybe, obviously, you're a stock analyst, but I wasn't really thinking about the impact to Apple's balance sheet. I was saying, thinking about the impact of small businesses because some even Dan, I was reading even some of the small businesses that took the uh, paycheck protection program money shuttered. They did not have enough money to continue on. So this is a, a thing that could potentially help some of these smaller app providers and look, create innovation comes from all different places, right? 
Yeah, and this doesn't really impact the bottom line. I mean, because if you look at, you know, cut, cutting this on what are mostly small-time apps, mm -hmm. it looks really good. I don't think there's that many apps that are teetering at $950,000 a year that this is a giant benefit for. These are really small apps that if they succeed, they succeed really big and they exceed that million-dollar amount. So, again, this is very cosmetic, but that doesn't mean it's not important. And it's frankly, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Let's shift gears, Dan. I think another story you wanted to talk about, um, those of us working from home, we may not always have the best internet. You know, I'm running a gigabit. I know you run a quite a bit. But many of our, co our, our peers, people out there, they may not have a 100 megabyte, uh, uh, you know, Wi-Fi connection. What do you do about that? So, so I sent you this story because I feel like the secret is out. So this was a story, <laughs> uh, you know, a news story about how Amazon says one of the top sellers this holiday season is going to be what's called mesh routers. Yep. I use a mesh router. Uh, and what it basically does is it kind of blankets your house uh, with internet. So I have one that's plugged in directly to my, you know, router that comes from my internet company. Mm -hmm. Then there's one right ne next to my desk. There's a third one in my son's room because he, he games and plays Xbox. And I'm not entirely sure why it works, but it's faster for me than being plugged directly in via an ethernet connection. It's also a much more continuous signal. Uh, it depends where you are. It depends what your core internet is. But I know for me at home, it made things 10 times faster. Uh, and on the upload, maybe three or four times. Well, most people aren't broadcasting. Uh, even if they have family Zoom meetings, it's not that important that their connection be, you know, be broadcast quality. Mm -hmm. But it is important that they don't drop out. And and you've done it, Jeff. If you have bad internet, like you're in a hotel, you plug your, your Roku in, you try to watch Netflix, and it lags and it goes really slowly. And that's not fun. So for about $200, you can buy a three-pack of Eero routers, which is an Amazon brand, E-E-R-O. Uh, and though there's plenty of other brands, uh, you know, certainly Google some reviews before you buy them. I think with all of us at home, and sometimes there's mom, dad, a couple of kids working all in the same shared internet connection, this speeds up your internet and setting it up takes maybe 10 minutes, and there's no technical skill to it. It's really, really simple. So this effectively, Dan, just kind of blankets the area, just kind of continuation of the signal um, in, in a location. Because to your point, if you live in an apartment, you live in a building, maybe you have metal studs instead of wooden studs. There's things where signals can get delayed or even muted completely. This kind of alleviates that. Yeah, a typical Wi-Fi signal gets weaker the farther you get away from the point of origin. And there's extenders and, and other things you could do. I've never found that those work all that well. Plugging directly in is generally the fastest, but somehow uh, these these mesh Wi-Fi routers are, are even faster than that. They just amp things up completely, uh, and it can vary. I know at our other house... Uh, it took a connection that was very dicey and made it three or four times faster. And mm -hmm. I really had significant lag when I loaded, say, like Sling TV or something, and that's gone away. And I can actually broadcast from that location with no problems. So, you know, for a relatively small amount of money, you know, at a time where, look, a lot of Christmas gifts are going to be practical, yep. if you can give a gift – that's going to make everyone in your households, uh, you know, your household have a better day-to-day -day internet experience, whether that be for school purposes, work purposes, or fun purposes. That's a pretty big gift uh, going on right now. Yeah, I think you're right, and I, you made a, a really good point there, Dan. That with kids not maybe not going into school because of the increase in COVID cases, it's not only work from home. Even though we let in with work from home, it's work from home. It's personal, but it's also educational and being connected with teachers look if you don't have a good connection and even the things hiccup a little bit with audio and video a little bit you can deal with if it's continuous you tend to lose interest and if i'm a younger person go, trying to learn something at school and if i can't get connectivity my my attention span might drop off and my education may drop off yeah, absolutely. Look, we have days in my house, and my son's physically back in school now, but when he was not in school, uh, we had days where I would be broadcasting from one room, my wife would be at a Zoom you know, meeting in another room, and my son would be on Google Classroom. That's a lot of bandwidth, you know, <laughs> and, and who knows what other games my son is playing in the background. So I think this technology, it's its here. Not a lot of people know about it. It's a great investment. I'll tell you, I've, I've sent them to members of, uh, of the 7Investing team. I've been really an, an advocate uh, 
you know, back, back when I was doing Motley Fool Live, this was something I told everyone to go out and get. It just makes your life easier. It also means like you don't really have to worry where you are in your house. The internet connection is going to be the same no matter where you are. And for me, I work on the couch some of the day. I work in the office some of the day. I've broadcast with you from my kitchen table. And it doesn't really matter where I am. <laughs> the internet is the same. And look, I live in a 1,300 square foot condo. So, it, you know, three of them is overkill. For a, If you're in a big 2,000 square foot house, you know, with, with multiple floors, you can just stack three or four of these and it just gives you a really amazing internet experience. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say, Dan, before we go close out is that people underestimate how many wireless devices they have. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I have a wife, two cats, but I'm looking in my room in my studio right now. I've got the computer, my phone, my tablet, and our printer. So the, a lot of that is a drag and people really need to think about what is and what is not connected. Well, Dan, always a pleasure chatting with you, and I'm looking forward, to, as always, to catching up before Thanksgiving with you on tech because a lot, a lot of stuff going on as we go into Black Friday. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk to you again very soon. I'll bring the turkey. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye. Welcome back. Now we're going to switch gears, talk a little about real estate and perhaps a lot more. Joining us on the line, Mr. Jacob Passy. He's real estate and also travel reporter for Market Watch. Jacob, happy Thanksgiving to you and your family, and uh, great to talk Same to you again. To you. Thank you so much. Yeah, great no, to talk I'm, to you. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely, and it's going to be a little bit of a different Thanksgiving for all of us, but I think we have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, so what's top yeah. of mind for you and uh, the uh, MW team this week? Yeah, so you know, maybe let's start. Um, I know we usually talk about uh, real estate, but maybe let's touch on travel for just a bit. Sure. We, you know, I think it's important to, to double down on you know the messages we've been getting from you know public health officials, and like you said, lots of you know Thanksgiving's right here, and and you know I think folks have that on the mind. So uh, wanted to dig into you know the latest reporting from Market Watch on travel, especially with the holiday season sure. right here. So, yeah, so, you know, I think to, to start, the, the, the one message I want to make from, from the top is the CDC says not to travel. I mean, the, the, and I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind. You know, they, there's no mandate. They're not requiring that everyone stay home. But, you know, their, their recommendation is clear. It is very risky to, you know, celebrate Thanksgiving with folks that are not in your immediate household. Um, you know, so... Uh, folks you don't live with, um, large Thanksgiving gatherings are inadvisable. And I think that, you know, folks need to keep that in mind as we're, you know, heading into this, you know, kind of uh, second, third wave, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there are a lot of concerns about what's going to happen in the next few weeks after Thanksgiving. Um, I think, you know, most public health officials I've talked to and my colleagues have talked to have said, you know, uh, there is, you know, pretty much a, uh, an expectation that cases are going to surge because of folks, you know, not abiding by those recommendations from the CDC, and um, you know we're going to see more cases, more hospitalizations, and more deaths as a result. So, you know, I think the the general consensus is, you know, uh, you know everyone wants to have a happy holidays, but uh, it won't be that happy if you get sick. So, just want to start with that from the top. But you know, that being said. Um, the travel industry is kind of at a bit of a crossroads right now because of all this. You know, this is usually one of the busiest, if not the busiest time of year for, you know, airlines and, you know, car rental companies and whatnot. And, you know, it's not clear how that's going to exactly pan out. Um, but at the same time, there has been, you know, increasing research on, you know, how safe is it to travel, um, especially by air. You know, that's been a big question since the pandemic began is, you know, can you catch it on a plane? You know, is it safe to, to travel by air, et cetera? So I did a story looking at those questions, looking at, you know, you know, you know questions like, you know, can't, is it safe to sit in the middle seat? Because, you know, a lot of airlines at the start were blocking off the middle seats, and now Delta is the only one that's still doing that. Um, and they actually committed this past week to doing that at least through March. Um, but the other airlines have, you know, either never implemented a policy like that or have, you know, done away with those policies. So interestingly, um, you know, there were there have been a couple studies, one done by the Defense Department and one done by researchers at Harvard University um, that looked at, you know, how the airflow systems work on planes and what that means for the risk of catching COVID on a plane. 
And what they found is that the risk is very low. Now, that does not mean there's no risk, and that's an important, you know, they, they quickly make that, that clarification. You know, low risk does not mean no risk. There is going to be a risk as long as there is a pandemic of you catching that, you know, illness from traveling uh, on a plane. But, you know, the point they made is this isn't, we know this is an airborne illness, and between, you know, the air circulation systems on planes that go through HEPA filters that push the air quickly and recirculate it quickly throughout a plane, um, and because of the requirements uh, to wear masks while traveling, those provide a significant amount of protection for you while you're on the plane. Um, but there are, you know, of course, uh, you know, some, you know, some risks that risk factors that will, you know, increase the likelihood of you know, getting sick. So one of them is, you know, if you eat on the plane, if you have to keep your mask off, you know, airlines allow that. But, you know, the longer you keep your mask off, the more likely it is that you're going to breathe in something. Yeah. Um, also, if everyone else around you is eating uh, and you take your mask off, you know, you're all breathing the same air from each other. Um, and so that's a, that's a concern, especially for folks taking long flights. Um, also, you know, the boarding process, you know, is everyone and, and the deep cleaning process, you know, is everyone crowding into the aisle first, first second they can take their seatbelt off like you, you saw in the before time. Um, well, that would make things really risky. And so airlines are doing their best to encourage social distancing throughout that process. But, you know, the risk remains. And then on top of that, you know, you may not be catching, you know, COVID or whatever on the plane itself. That doesn't take into account all the touch points and spaces you're in throughout the rest of the process, you know, waiting in the terminal, you know, going through security, you know, taking the cab to the airport. There are so many other touch points at which you could get, you know, you could contract COVID that, you know, the plane alone isn't the only risk here. So I just, I figured it was, you know, with a lot of folks thinking about traveling right now, good to talk about the risk. Involved. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, these are extraordinary times, Jacob. We're seeing a, a, a we just talked to Lydia Ramsey earlier in the show from Business Insider about the vaccine. That doesn't mean that there's good good news on the horizon, but that doesn't mean it's here right now. We still got to de- take the precautions to mitigate uh, infecting ourselves, or more importantly, others around us. So I, I think people just need to kind of remember that if you if you must go. Uh, because there's not a, I, I guess in certain cities or states there are some more onerous provisions. But if you must go, you know you you want to take precautions. What's uh what's happening on the uh, the real estate front? There's that you know I I keep reading about mortgage rates. Um, but but I I knew you were the person to come to in general about real estate. Yeah. So uh, yeah, no, there, there's good reason you're hearing about mortgage rates because they dropped to another record low this week. Um, it's the thirteenth time in 2020 that mortgage rates have fallen to a record low, according to Freddie Mac. Um, quite stunning when you, you think about it. And that comes just after a week ago when they rose because of the vaccine. And uh, I think you and I talked, uh, have talked about, you know, the effects the vaccine would have, you know, I think the general consensus is, you know, it, rates, once things return to normal, rates will also start creeping back upward. But, you know, this week, you know, last week they rose and this week they fell. It kind of just shows that, Nothing is set in stone. Um, They fell this week because of, you know, disappointing data uh, regarding retail spending Mm -hmm. uh, and consumer spending. Um, And, you know, I think the economy is still on really shaky footing. Um, There's concerns about what's going on now. The Treasury Department possibly pulling back some of the funds from the Fed, uh, the emergency lending money that they gave to the Fed to, you know, support the economy through the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think some investors are concerned about what that means for the economy if we don't have that fallback option and things do get bad again in the next few months. Um, but because of low mortgage rates, um, you know, housing remains one of those sectors that's kind of been resilient. You know, uh, this week we got a number of different um, monthly reports. Uh, the Home Builder Confidence Index is at an all-time high. Um, and uh, existing home sales, which came out on Thursday, um, they showed the highest level of home sales. This was for October, mm-hmm. the highest level in 16 years, roughly. Wow. Um, so pretty, pretty remarkable stuff. And it kind of shows that, you know, low rates are really, you know, encouraging. And, and also, you know, we, it's not just rates, though. It's the fact that, you know, certainly lots of folks are looking to get more space amid the pandemic. We don't know how much longer this is going to go on for. So if you've got kids, you might want an extra room, larger backyard, things like that. 
Um, also, just you know, the, the timing of things. You know, this year was probably going to be a big year for home sales. You know, regardless of the pandemic, um, because a lot of millennials, you know, are entering their peak home buying years. They're getting married. They're having kids. All that talk a few years ago of millennials not wanting to own homes. That you know, I mean, if you talk to real estate economists, they said that was kind of uh, you know a, a myth that there was no real evidence to support that, and that's what we're seeing right now. You know, you're seeing people reaching those you know defining life moments that lead you to want to buy a home, and they are indeed buying homes. Um, but you know, there's still risk factors at play. You know, because mortgage rates are so low, and because there's such high demand. We're seeing record-breaking price appreciation. You know, home prices are just going up, up and up across much of the country. And there's going to come a time when you know the savings uh, offered by low mortgage rates aren't enough to offset that. And we're almost at that point now. That even though mortgage rates dropped to a record low this week, um, according to an analysis from Realtor.com, that only um, you know equated to a four dollar a month savings when you take into account rising home prices. So, you know, when, you know, it, it, from where it was before. So, you know, the, these lower rates are, you know, the effects are dwindling pretty rapidly. I mean, $4 a month is, you know, you know, it's not nothing over the course of a 30 year loan, but it, it's not a whole lot of money. Sure. Um, and so, you know, if it, we get to a point where price appreciation, you know, keeps growing and, especially if mortgage rates do start edging upward, you're going to see lots of people who are just priced out of the market. And it's unclear you know, to what extent that will hurt uh, you know, the market for home sales. Yeah. Well, it, look, I think that you, you make some, you know, make some really good points in terms of the, the potential return for normalcy. We are going to see rising rates. And you may, I was just thinking when you were talking about people wanting an extra room, I could, I could tell you right now, uh, I think there are a lot of people who want an extra room just because they've been stuck with their families for a long period of time and probably want some places they can go and hide out for a little while. Jacob, we're going to leave it there. Always a pleasure chatting with you, wishing you a very happy holiday to you and your family, and we look forward to catching up with you again next week. Okay. Welcome back, and let's check in on what the hottest social media topics were this week. Joining us online. He's a senior financial services editor for LinkedIn. He's also the editor of the This Week in Finance newsletter, which, of course, you can find on the LinkedIn platform, Devin Banerjee. Devin, welcome back to the program. Great to see you this morning or talk to you this morning. I saw you earlier, but I get to talk to you now again. How are you? <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. Always good to chat twice with you in one week. Actually, typically more than two times in, in, in one week. That's true. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of yours, following you on LinkedIn, looking at your chats uh, chats, and, and, and the things that are happening. Um, so what's top of mind? I know we had you on the network on Friday um, talking about zombie companies, but uh, what, what else has crossed your mind um, and the team's mind this week in terms of the hottest conversations on the platform? Yeah, absolutely. The zombie conversation was really interesting. So as always, I'd encourage people – uh, to check out uh, our conversation on the network, uh, that interview. But uh, one of our other most popular items this week, Jeff, that I'm going to start with today, uh, we titled Every Day is Payday for this company. And uh, this company that I'm talking about is PayPal. Uh, PayPal came out this week to say that it has partnered with the startup uh, called Even. Uh, the longer name is Even Responsible Finance. Uh, it's, it's a startup that PayPal has invested in in the past, actually with a strategic corporate investment because it believed in what it's doing. Effectively, what even does, Jeff, is it allows employees access to their compensation as soon as they earn it, uh, sometimes on a daily basis. And that is opposed to <coughs> – excuse me – sure opposed to waiting every two weeks uh, for your paycheck, as, as uh, many of us do. So the reason PayPal is doing this is that it actually went about surveying all of its employees to find out how many of them are struggling financially and in what ways they're struggling. And uh, CEO Dan Schulman said he was actually surprised at how much of PayPal's workforce, both hourly employees and salaried employees, are working uh, or are, are living paycheck to paycheck, really, which is to say they don't have 
a lot of what Paycheck is calling net disposable income. So, you know, that's, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the percentage of their paychecks left over after paying taxes and other necessary living expenses. And so um, PayPal has partnered with Even, and it's allowing all of its employees, all of the employees at PayPal, to access their money, their, their earnings, their paycheck, as soon as it's earned on a daily basis, and also giving them access to Even's other resources, which include uh, savings plans, budgeting plans, uh, you know, spending and budgeting plans, et cetera. So it, it, it's a really interesting partnership. It's one of the larger companies that that has partnered with this company, Even. Mm-hmm. Um, parts of Walmart have done it. Parts of Humana have done it. Parts of some other big companies. But PayPal's allowing all of its employees access. It's also covering the subscription fee uh, for, uh, for uh, access to the startup, Even. So Really interesting conversation on the platform. Again, as I said, it was one of our most popular items. We're seeing a lot of employees um, just reading fully through it, reading all the details, and uh, starting those conversations internally with their employers about potentially uh, doing something similar. Well, it sure as heck beats getting a payday loan, Devin. I mean, the interest rates on those things are outrageous, and you can never get out from, pardon yep. me, out from under the payday loan. And I think. A lot of, you know, I, I think we saw, I want to say it was Nebraska, but I could be wrong, actually cap the payday loan percentage. Again, I could be wrong if, on, the, on the state, but one state legislature passed legislation to do that uh, because there is concern if you need money. And people do need money, especially with no stimulus. Uh, they're looking for alternatives like um, even or others to provide that service. So I, it couldn't come at a more timely opportunity, and hopefully other organizations will look at either even or similar uh, services that, that can help their employees out because people need money, especially during the holiday. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this segment I learned is called on-demand pay apps. And so even as even as uh, one of them, um, the, the, there may be others, and so employers and managers can go check out the different options. But I, again, as I said, that was just a very popular item, probably because, Jeff, you know, as you said, um, there are so many people who are struggling financially during this time. They may be benefiting from uh, stimulus programs that, uh, unfortunately, as it stands, are set to expire in a couple of weeks uh, right after Christmas. And so a lot of people are trying to figure out how to, you know, um, access their, their paychecks uh, more consistently and also just work on their, their spending and their budgeting. Yeah, really smart. Um, another very popular story just this week, um, kind of a, some unfortunate statistics, but it's a report out of LinkedIn and the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society just reinforcing something you and I have talked about, but it's just such an important topic, which is how disproportionately this pandemic and economic downturn are weighing on women in particular. Um, and so... LinkedIn and this uh, Women's Forum for the Economy and Society partnered to uh, do a statistically significant, robust survey of about 3,500 people across Europe and the United States. Um, And what it found is that about half of women surveyed uh, said they were less inclined to take on new responsibilities at at work right now Mm -hmm. um, because it would make it more difficult to uh, combine those responsibilities with their duties at home. So that was uh, 46% of women, and that compares to 32% of women, uh, of men, I should say, a very st- statistically significant difference there. Um, the vast majority of women, 79%, said they felt significantly more tired and stressed due to juggling that childcare um, and, uh, and 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 their professional responsibilities. So that and that 79% compares with 61% of men. So again. Uh, very statistically significant difference. Um, we paired these findings with a uh, really good story out of the New York Times uh, titled Recession with a Difference, and that difference is that women face a special burden in this recession. And the New York Times really made the point, Jeff, that this pandemic has delivered what they call a very rare and ruinous triple punch. So that first punch we've talked about is that jobs typically dominated by women in retail and healthcare and restaurants were the earliest and the hardest hit. That second wave or second punch of the triple punch is that um, 
the pandemic then took out a lot of roles in, in government, state and local government. Uh, that's another area where women outnumber men. And the final blow came with, of course, the closure of uh, child care facilities, mm. uh, you know, schools, the move to remote learning, which, again, just in, in our society does fall disproportionately uh, to to women in terms of that burden. So just, uh, you know, you know it's, it's not something new. We've been talking about it for a couple months now, um, but a uh, very important topic there. Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, there was already a gap um, there. Looks like the gap is expanding, uh, and it's not just women. Uh, I mean, I know the survey was focused on women, but racially, there's a lot more racial disparity uh, in terms of earnings and savings uh, for people, um, different my- ethnicities, and big concern. And um, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. So hopefully, uh, you know, those in Congress, if when they get back to working. Uh, if they get back to working and doing something, they can maybe begin to thinking about a plan. Uh, and also maybe some private companies can think about a plan to maybe help uh, some, some of these groups kind of uh, repair their savings and seek out their financial independence. Yeah, absolutely. It will just make the economic recovery look, you know, much more lopsided than it should be. You know, this 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 triple punch that women are facing you know, it's often more difficult for them to, to re-enter the workforce after they um, have, have have exited because of these conditions going on the past eight, nine months. And so that's why it's just so important to to address these issues now so that that economic recovery is uh, is, 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 is much more equitable. Um, okay, final issue, Jeff, is actually an update to one that you and I spoke about, I think, like 12, 18 months ago, mm-hmm. which was all the different paths, the new paths into the C-suite. So our economic graph team loves to look through all the data on LinkedIn in terms of where hiring is occurring across the globe. And um, again, about 18 months ago, we looked at the new ways into the C-suite with all those different titles in the C-suite. So we did an update on that looking at just the past year. Um, So first of all, at a high level, C-suite hiring has actually fallen about 18% from from 2019. So the turnover in the C-suites is a bit lower this year, probably we think because, um, you know, just the, the the stress and uncertainty that companies have been going through. They, they don't want to make changes at the top. Uh, they, they, they want continuity. Um, and they want institutional knowledge, institutional memory to carry them through this period. Mm-hmm. But a couple titles really bucked the trend, and we've seen a huge jump in them. The first one is not going to surprise you, Jeff. It's chief diversity officer. We saw an 84% jump uh, in in hiring for that title uh, this year. Wow. Uh, compared to the same period last year. Yeah. Number two on that list is chief growth officer. We're seeing a lot more companies uh, hiring for that role. Uh, chief underwriting officer, which obviously is, in a, is, a, is a popular title in the insurance space, mm. was number three. Uh, Chief Revenue Officer, number four, and Chief Investment Officer, number five. That one I actually need to do some more reporting on and figuring figure out what the what you know what's going on with turnover among the Chief Investment Officer roles, whether that's at pensions or 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 foundations, endowments, or whether that's on the asset management side. I'll need to figure out. But um, very interesting list. There are eleven more. We have sixteen <clears throat> in total uh, C-suite titles that have bucked the trend <clears throat> and uh, risen. In, uh, in 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 hiring this year, Devin, any chance that there's a chief anchor officer on the uh, on the list? <laughs> we need to dig deeper in that data, but I'm sure you're uh, into that data, Jeff. But but I'm sure your name will come up on that. One. I appreciate that. Look, in all seriousness, I can understand the importance of continuity, and you know, I think we have talked before about the diversity officer turnover, um, and that's for a number of reasons. I think people oftentimes get the job and then. They get there, and maybe the organization's not ready for change, right? And and I think if I recall the conversation that we had, Devin, that was one of the key indicators that people said, "Hey, you know, I'm, I I may not be interested in the job if we're not going to affect real change." Exactly. That's a great great, great memory, Jeff, from that <laughs> conversation. Which is, chief diversity officers are it's so important to empower them. And and oh, actually, and now I'm realizing we've talked about this twice this data because uh, more recently earlier this year we did talk about. This topic in particular, which is what makes a chief diversity officer hire successful, and that is access to the CEO 
access to resources yep. and empowered to make decisions, autonomy to make decisions. So you're absolutely right. Even as we see this jump in hiring for those roles, it remains to be seen uh, whether those roles will will be successful, but those are some of the factors that are required to be successful. Well, you have a better memory than I do, Devin, because you remember we talked about it twice. Well, Devin, uh, pleasure chatting with you. I want to wish you and your family a very happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Bye-bye. Welcome back. Now, time to talk a little about retirement. After all, that's what our network and show are all about. Joining us on the line is Alessandra Melito of MarketWatch. She's a retirement reporter there, of course. Allie, great to talk with you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, thank you. So what's uh, what's top of mind this week when it comes to retirement and saving and financial independence? Yeah, so I did a story recently about um, our president-elect and one of the provisions of his proposal for Social Security. Um, As the retirement reporter, I always love seeing proposals and new laws being made, you know, regarding retirement. So in this case, I was focusing on the minimum benefit that he wants to have for Social Security. Um, His proposal, according to his campaign site, was that um, there would be a minimum benefit for people who worked for 30 years, mm-hmm. and it would be uh, 120, 125% of the federal federal poverty line. So, um, in other words, people who maybe worked um, their whole lives earning low income would would get this this benefit, mm-hmm. um, and that's you know obviously a good thing for people who. <laughs> You know, uh, maybe for their entire careers, we're only making minimum wages, things like that. Um, so that's a proposal that he has in the works. It's not necessarily new. We did have that. It was enacted in the early 1970s. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's outdated now because that benefit was tagged to the CPI as opposed to um, – the you know, Social Security standard benefit, which is indexed for average wages. So as every year went on, earnings obviously outpace prices, and therefore the number of people who qualify for that benefit um, gets smaller and smaller. So this would basically just be updating that. And there have been a few analyses about it. One came out of uh, Penn Warden, and it was it basically said – These are off the top of my head, but um, in 2019, people who qualified for the special minimum benefit would have gotten $800, and if the proposal was, you know, around instead, they would have gotten $1,300. So this does mean that people can see a couple hundred dollars at least more in Social Security benefits. Yeah, and and as we talked about, I think we talked about it on – a, few, a former podcast, um, you know the the call the call the cost of living adjustment. I think for 2021 is like 1.3 percent, if I'm not mistaken, Allie. I mean, it is it is minuscule, which results in not a lot of money for people. So clearly, you know, if you're relying on Social Security, it's going to be very difficult um, in a lot of ways to have a, a successful retirement. Right? You are going to need some level of supplemental income, uh, Allie. What what are the chances? Obviously. It's not January 21st yet. There's a lot of things that have to happen between now and then. Uh, new Congress takes uh, takes form in January. What are the the likelihood that you know proposals are proposals, but do they you know do they actually get proposed and passed? As far as the timeline, um, I have no idea, and I know a lot of other people have no idea. Honestly, I don't think it's fair to expect anything right away because there's so much going on these days. But as far as, you know, the likelihood of people liking it on both sides of the aisle, um, the people that I've spoken to at least say that there's a strong possibility. You know, everybody knows that something has to happen with Social Security because right now the program is, you know, facing insolvency issues. Um, And this is something that it doesn't, it wouldn't cost a lot because there are so many restrictions as it is for people to qualify for this benefit. So it's not like every single American would be getting it. It's only the people who 
you know, make the cut, which they mm-hmm. have to have worked 30 years. They have to have, you know, the lowest earnings, things like that. Um, so it is something that at least the experts that I spoke to said there's a possibility that it will be approved, this particular provision, among Republicans and Democrats. Because, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You're just you're just giving um, people with lifetime low earnings a little bit more so that they're not in poverty in retirement. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and keep in mind, we, I think as we talked about on another show, Ali, I mean, there's other – uh, legislation that's out there uh, dealing with retirement, retirement plans. So it could be something that is comprehensive. And it look, if it's an easy fix and it doesn't cost a lot from a budget or a scoring, you know, it's, it's revenue pretty much revenue neutral. Um, why wouldn't you do that to make someone someone's lives easier, someone's life easier, especially when they've you know worked thirty years in a job or been retired for a period of time? Yeah. Well, Ali, we're going to uh, leave it there. Really appreciate you coming on the show and want to wish you and uh, your family a very happy Thanksgiving. And we look forward to having you back again next week. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. One, one, two, two, three into the phone. Snoop Doggy Dogg and Dr. Dre. Welcome back. We're going to check in on Marcus. And joining us on the line, he's lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network. You can see him on Markets on the Close and Morning Trade Live, Mr. Oliver Rennick. Hey, Oliver, how are you? Jeff, doing all right. Just uh, watching a very interesting week, and uh, you know, getting ready for a quarantined weekend. Yeah, well, you're in the uh, lovely city of Chicago. Beautiful city, by the way. I've been there numerous times. Nice, nice, nice uh, beautiful weather. Nice people, and uh, <laughs> if you get out, you know, if you can get out, out and house. see them, right? If you can get out and see them. But um, you know, I always love chatting with you and uh, Kevin Kelly because you really break down what's happening in the markets. Um, so what are some of the themes, you know, we look at the last five days, you know, we're, we're recording this on Friday afternoon, it's about one twenty Eastern time. So the market's not yet closed, but give us your assessment for the week. How do you see things shaping up? We've had a pretty kind of, um, split week. We've started off the week on follow through from the vaccine news flow, Moderna a week later after Pfizer's announcement confirming that a vaccine is part of our future. Then in the second half of the week, the market kind of refocused towards what's happening right now. COVID lockdowns, major curve in the pickup of cases and hospitalizations and uh, starting to see deaths pick up as well. So a not good situation on the COVID front. And because of that, we just have this totally uh, flipped market in the second half of the week, pretty bizarre as we see now on the whole five-day period, you'll see gains across both reopening companies and these quarantine-style trades. So we kind of see how this market has both stories intertwined, working kind of short versus long-term. But overall, we just are unable still to sell off in a meaningful way based on COVID, and we're really unable to rally in a meaningful way, uh, even with some of this vaccine news. And then, you know, uh, earlier in the week, uh, you know, I've, we've uh, just saying as a point of reference, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, I mean, it was close to breaking 30,000. And uh, mm-hmm. that was on the heels of the, I think, on the heels of the vaccine. I think maybe some, some other things that were going on. Real positive. And now we're kind of in that, we're still in the 29,000 range. But as you, as you said, I mean, we've got a spike in COVID cases. Um, we, we don't know where we're going for Thanksgiving, pr- presumably nowhere based on what we're being told by CDC and public health officials. So a lot of that has really kind of, I guess, dampened or muted some of that, that positive news we heard early in the week. Oliver, what about the bond market? Because we always talk about equities. Have you seen any, mm-hmm. any change in the bond market? So the bond market was a little bit uh, more kind of um, pronounced this week in expressing some degree of, uh, you know, risk off tendencies, but we have to be careful. So bonds were up these past five days. Yields were down. And one could argue that the bond market then is kind of looking with some more sort of trepidation at the situation right now. Mm -hmm. However, it's hard to run too far with that argument when the bond market since August has been steadily trending higher in yield. And this week's drop in the 10-year yield 
brings us basically right along kind of this range that you can draw on a chart kind of right where you'd think we would be. So um, to some degree, it doesn't look like anything really noteworthy in terms of the Treasury action this week. That being said, the big surge that we saw in yields on the back of the Pfizer news has now faded almost entirely back to where it was the day prior. Not quite, but almost back. So you can see that it's just going to take more convincing, basically. That's kind of the message. It's going to take more convincing before financial markets really start to orient themselves toward this type of recovery. Um, but uh, it definitely is more pronounced in some of the reopening stocks. So like the companies that depend on crowds forming or people traveling, a lot of these stocks now really do show breakouts happening on the charts, which seem to suggest that we know that over time, there's now like a floor to how bad it's going to be. So the market seems to be expressing, okay, yes, there's a vaccine that is part of our future that's going to be effective. We're going to have this thing beaten within a year. But in the short to intermediate term, it's anyone's guess what it's going to mean for the economy. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating to watch when you take a step back. Um, what about the yield curve? I mean, are you still I – I know you mentioned that yields are, are down but that, that yield right. curve, having an inverted yield curve is often a sign, I believe, of a weaker economy. Um, but, but how has the yield curve right. looked um, in recent days, I guess, or, or last this week, I guess? Pretty similar because we haven't changed much from the Fed's messaging. So it's yeah. mostly about the 10-year and the longer end bond yields creeping up over the last couple months. So this week, though, yeah, our yield curve did – it squished in a little bit, but actually relative to the 10-year, we're still fairly elevated in the trend for the yield curve as well. And uh, we actually broke above the June levels. If we recall kind of the first time the COVID waves went down before we had our second wave, there was real hope that, okay, we beat this thing. And this whole reopening trade happened. Yields shot up in June, and then they came right back down. Um, that's kind of uh, now our benchmark for gauging the market's conviction towards reopening and we are above those levels in the yield curve right now which suggests a good degree of confidence that this time is much more serious potential for recovery well let's keep our fingers crossed well oliver we're going to leave it there enjoy your thanksgiving okay. no matter where it is and uh we'll look forward to having you back on the program very soon my friend Welcome back. I'm time to take a look at what's going on on Capitol Hill in terms of legislation and regulation. Joining me on the line, they are better known as the Legal Eagles, David Levine, Kevin Walsh. Both are principals with Groom Law Group, an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us on the program. How are you today? We are great. We wish all the listeners a happy Thanksgiving week as they head into, well, maybe travel, maybe not, but if nothing else, a safe and enjoyable Thanksgiving, knowing it's certainly been a long year for all. And uh, given there's so much going on, I'm going to stop there and say, Mr. Walsh, what's top of mind for you this week? <laughs> so, so, David, top of mind for me this week is really its holiday traditions. Um, and, you know, December is a time of, of real traditions and, and, you know, whether it's uh, – dreidels or Christmas trees or whatever else people may celebrate. In D.C., we have one holiday tradition, which is it's really special, and, and the whole nation tends to look at it. Um, and that's the, that's the government funding deadline. And the government funding deadline can be set at any time. Um, but they tend yeah, yeah, Kevin, Kevin, I got to jump in. I got to tell you, Christmas time, nothing says Christmas like funding. <laughs> I usually think of it as shopping, but clearly I've been mistaken. So please well, nothing, keep going. Well, nothing does say funding like Christmas, because what, what tends to happen is um, in order to get, you know, congressional agreement on, on a continuing resolution, um, in order to get uh, congressional, you know, agreement on, on how to fund at least a couple of months, um, they tend to try to set the funding deadlines around holidays, where there's going to be pressure on congressmen and senators um, and congresswomen where they want to get home to their districts, um, and also where they don't want to be accused of ruining the holidays. So this year, uh, they've set up the government hunt funding deadline uh, as December 11th, which means that if we don't have a, a, a funding bill passed by then, uh, the government would shut down. And, you know, it's, a, it, it's like that old children's book, uh, How the Shutdown Stole Christmas, um, which I think everyone reads in D.C. Um, 
it, it just it, it, it but, creates some but, real pressure. But Kevin, I thought I thought it could all be done by executive order. Who needs a budget? Well, so it, it creates some pressure to to get things done quickly. Now, the reason this relates to benefits is because um, government funding bills are also a place where, uh, because they are big spending bills, where there's an opportunity to, you know, add, um, how do we call them, Christmas tree ornaments, I, I'd say. Um, and here, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of hope that we would see some um, extension of some of the provisions in the CARES Act, mm -hmm. whether they be things like allowing the hardship distributions that are permitted in 2020 due to COVID uh, to be taken in 2021. Um, or for there to be some form of pension funding relief. Um, but there's, there's a whole lot of, you know, I, I, I dare say hope, um, as this is a season of optimism, uh, that we'll see some relief. But I, I suspect it's probably going to be 2021 um, after, after the new year when we, we see real relief. But uh, all eyes are on D.C. in the next couple of weeks, whether or not, you know, the holiday spirit can bring the, 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 the two sides of Congress together uh, to keep the lights on through the holidays. Uh, David, do you have any other thoughts on, on government funding, or are you going to pivot to your, your favorite topic, which is uh, new forms released by government agencies? You know, I, I think you hit it really well, but, it, you know, nothing says on the first day of Christmas my true love gave to me a government shutdown and no funding for anybody. So I understand that. But, uh, I, you know, I think you hit it, Kevin. I, I think I'm going to hit two quick things. One we're going to be busy in the next probably 60 days because I, I think there's a real chance, given the Trump administration's focus, that we're going to see a bunch more guidance pushing its way forward. So, Jeff, we're going to have something to talk about that will not be as snarky and tongue as cheek as Jeff, so, uh, sorry, as Kevin and I are being. But an example of that is we talked about pooled <laughs> employer plans and PEPs. Uh, the, the pool plan provider registration form is out. Uh, it has instructions. It kind of follows the final guidance that came out pretty much. But at the same time, it's out. So if you're interested in being a PEP, a PPP, take a look at it. It's something to talk about. But with that said, I'm going to call it a day because I thought Kevin really did a great job, despite the snarkiness we throw at each other, and wish all of our listeners a happy and even more importantly to me, safe Thanksgiving. Well, well said, guys. And David, I've got a, I've got a brief little PSA announcement, which is, you know, don't be a turkey. Socially distance this Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I... Go ahead, David. You have a retort to that? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't. You know, we could go on and on, Jeff. And I know your show does not go for four hours, uh, uh, even though we get paid by the word. So I'm going to yeah. stop. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much. Wishing you and your families a very uh, happy Thanksgiving. Stay safe. And we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Well, that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Don't forget, we're back again tomorrow morning for BRN AM. I'll be joined by Karen Cho of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. We're going to talk about how America banks. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.